So good morning everyone. Welcome back to Math 115. Oh, you can't see the thing, can you? Jesus. It's that kind of morning, I guess. Well, we gotta wait for the projector to come down, but uh, while I say that, or while that happens, uh, let me say this. Um, it's that time of year where things start to get hellishly difficult for some people. I know when I was an undergrad, this was like the worst time of the year because it feels like all your classes suddenly are like, you realize you maybe were behind in one of your classes or, uh, or you just have a lot of us exams at the same time. Projects are starting to happen, final projects, you gotta do group work and all of that stuff. Anyways, what I'm trying to say is that can all be very taxing on your mental health and it's really important to take care of that. So uh, make sure that you're curating that to the best of your ability. If you'd like help getting connected with mental health resources, then please send me an email and I can get you uh, connected with some of the resources that we have on campus for that. I'm not saying, well, I, I, what I can't guarantee is that we can't learn something because uh, I have a duty of care as an <laughs> instructor to prepare you for your next class. And uh, trust me, if we take a mental health day today and, and don't learn anything, uh, it will hurt you. It will hurt you later on. <laughs> Can we have the screen yet, please? Okay, we got the screen. All right, so uh, today we're going to talk over a new chapter. We're going to start chapter five point or start chapter five with section five point one. Uh, for homework, you have a homework assignment which is due today. That's the homework assignment on inverse trig. Um, so that's due today. Our next assessment will be exam two, which is this Wednesday. So uh, we will have a review in class tomorrow. Okay, all of the exam questions will be pulled from the homework assignments. The homework assignments which I will pull questions from will be homeworks 3.2 up to 4.6. So uh, what I want to say about this exam is that it covers logarithms and trigonometry, which are basically two of what I would consider to be the most challenging topics from this course. So you may need to plan accordingly with your studying in terms of uh, I would probably increase the amount of studying that you do for this exam as it compares to exam one and exam two if you want to achieve the same score. Uh, so it's just the nature of the class. Exam three is going to be probably the most challenging uh, exam that you take for this course. Uh, so prepare accordingly. Come to office hours. I will try to record my office hours tomorrow. We will be in LeCant 109. I have the room reserved for us. So uh, that's the room that we're going to be in. And uh, I will cast my iPad and record it. So if you can't come to office hours, you can watch the YouTube video. Um, so that's office hours. Uh, so in addition to the office hours, we're also going to review in class tomorrow morning. And I'll also record that and post it to my YouTube channel as usual. Um, the length of the exam will be the same as the length of the others. It'll be like three pages and then a bonus. And uh, yeah. So maybe I'll spend a second going through something really quickly, which is if you feel like when you study for a math exam, you don't know what you're supposed to be doing. Uh, I have this section on the syllabus, which you may find helpful. So you won't be able to see this in the recording. But on the syllabus, down at the bottom, I have the study tips. And then I have how to study for an exam. OK, this is how you can study for uh, exams. So this might uh, be of use to some of you if you feel like you don't know uh, what to do. The best thing that you can be doing since the exam problems come directly from the homework is redoing the homework problems. Okay. Um, you know, it's maybe the what I would do is go through every single homework assignment and I would go through each problem and maybe not do every problem, but ask myself, can I do this problem if I just sat down with pen and paper, no notes, no nothing right now 
And if the answer is yes, move on. If the answer is no, practice that problem. And if you can't get it after practice, then write down the problem and come to office hours and say, I can't do problem 3.2.64. Okay, so that's, that's how I would study. So practice, 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 lots and lots of problems. If you're not able to do it from scratch with no notes, then you're not prepared for that topic. So that's how uh, you study is just keep doing it and doing it and doing it and use less help and less help and less help each time until you can do it on your own. Um, also, you've got the Math Tutoring Center. Just go, if, if you're somebody who just can't make themselves study, then put yourself in the Math Tutoring Center and someone else will like help you study for you. Okay, and that way it takes some of the willpower requirement off of you if you can just get yourself to the math tutoring center, get yourself to office hours, get yourself to class. Uh, that will help you to lessen the burden of, of willpower on yourself. Okay, so that's the exam and the homework and all of that stuff. So are there any administrative questions before we start in on content for today? All right, it doesn't seem like there are, so let's talk about some trigonometric identities. We've already actually learned a few trigonometric identities, which are the ones shown here. So what do they say? The reciprocal identities just tell us that uh, there is a relationship between cosecant and sine, right? Namely, if I take one and divide by cosecant, I get sine, and the other way around, right? If I take one divided by sine, I get cosecant. Okay, so why is that true? That's true because cosecant of x is going to be the y-coordinate of the point on the unit circle, which is pointed at, not the y-coordinate, it's going to be 1 over y, uh, where y is the y-coordinate of the point on the unit circle, which is pointed at by the angle x. Okay, so we put the angle x inside there. We go to this point on the unit circle. This point has coordinates, question mark, question mark. We take the y-coordinate, divide 1 by that coordinate. That's how we get cosecant. And it's kind of similar to what we do with sine, except with sine, we just take the y-coordinate. So you notice that sine of x would just be equal to that y-coordinate. So these two right-hand sides are reciprocals of one another. Namely, if I divide 1 by y, I get 1 over y. And if I do 1 divided by 1 over y, I also get y, because dividing by a fraction is the same as multiplying by the reciprocal. So the two of them, they're reciprocals of each other, right? the reciprocals of each other. So that's why we get these two here for cosecant and sine. And likewise, there's a similar identity for secant and, and cosine. Why, oh, I'm on a racer. Secant and cosine, and also cotangent and tangent. OK, and why do we call them identities? This is an interesting uh, question that was raised before class. What is the difference between an identity and an equation? Well, here is a quadratic equation. x squared plus 2x plus 1 is equal to 0. This is an equation where, depending on what x value I choose, could be true or not true. You have to solve for x. And there's only, like, negative 1 is like the only number that will actually cause this equation to be true. However, in an identity, no matter what x value I put in, it's going to be true, as long as it's the same x value for both of the right-hand side and the left-hand side. It's always going to be true. So that is what we call an identity as opposed to an equation. So some other ones we know are the quotient identities, Okay, namely tan is sine over cosine. That's because the tangent is y over x, and y is the output of the sine function, x is the output of the cosine function, so you can rewrite tangent as the quotient of sine and cosine. Likewise for cotangent, except of course it's going to be the reciprocal. Why is, if you take this identity and apply this identity to it, right, apply this identity to it to do a change on it, then you will see why this final one should be true, right? Just reciprocal thing. Okay, and then we have the Pythagorean identities, which basically basically just come from those three triangles that I drew on the unit circle. Uh, but you can always get these ones 
from the first one. So I only recommend that you memorize the first one, and then you remember that you are going to divide the whole thing by either sine squared of x, or you're going to divide the whole thing by cosine squared of x in order to get the other ones. OK, and then even in odd identities, I don't even know if I would call this an identity. I mean, I guess it is an identity, but really it's just capturing the fact that sine is an odd function, cosine is an even function, tangent is an odd function. Okay, And the respective reciprocal functions will have the same even or oddness as their parent. Okay, So namely, cosecant is odd because sine is odd. Secant is even because cosine is even. Cotangent is odd because tangent is odd. OK, so these are the identities which we know so far. And we're going to use them. We're going to use them to derive or verify or disprove many, many, many other identities that are not as clear cut as these ones are. So before we move on to those trickier, more nuanced identities, are there any questions on why any of 1, 2, 3, or 4 should be true? OK. Well, you can always. I mean, they're kind of, OK. It's kind of hard to see just looking at them why they should be true. But I promise you that if you draw a unit circle and some triangles and you have a good grasp of geometry, you'll be able to see why each of one of these should be true. Or for the even and odd identities, if you draw the graphs, you'll be able to see why, uh, why they should be true. OK, so here is what we are going to do. We are going to always keep these four identities in the back of our mind. OK, so these four classes of identities are worth memorizing. OK, if you want, put them on a flashcard uh, and, and just study them here and there when you have a few minutes between class, OK, and memorize them. Because these ones are worth memorizing. What's not worth memorizing is something like the following. No, not something like that. Something like this. No, that's a disproved one. Jesus. OK. Something like this is not worth memorizing. Why is this not worth memorizing? Because it's not immediately recognizable as one of the main ones. So what we're going to do, our game is going to be to manipulate this identity into one of the ones that we know is true. And if we can manipulate, we can say this identity is equivalent to one of the ones that we know is true, then this one must be true. Okay, so that's the preview of where we're going. But we need some tools before we can do that. So let's start with rewriting. So oftentimes when we want to try to simplify one side of an identity or something like that, uh, our brains, or at least my brain, is not great at uh, at thinking about what 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 is cotangent, cosecant, and secant, and whether multiplying them by each other would be would result in something interesting or not. So what I like to do, and what I recommend you to do, is many times you should start by simplifying the trig expressions by translating everything into sine and cosine. Okay, translating everything into sine and cosine. So how am I going to do that? Cotangent of x, I'm going to use this identity to rewrite cotangent of x as cosine of x divided by sine of x, and so on and so forth for all of the other uh, ones. So let's go through this example here. So cotangent of x, I can rewrite this as cosine of x divided by, uh, what am I doing, sine of x. Then I'm going to add tangent of x. I can rewrite as the reciprocal of cotangent of x, right? Sine of x divided by cosine of x. So you can think of that, if you want, as the reciprocal of this guy. Or you can just say, well, I use the identity that says tangent is equal to sine over cosine, whichever one you want. 
then a plus, and then now cosecant. What is that in terms of sine and cosine? How do I rewrite cosecant? Yeah, 1 over sine x, good. 1 over sine of x. Okay, remember, the world is not as it should be. Cosecant goes with sine, and secant goes with cosine. So I'm going to multiply this, since there's a multiplication here, an implicit multiplication. I'm going to write 1 over cosine of x, yes? Okay, so now I have translated everything into sine and cosine. And now my game will be to simplify this expression. I have an addition of four fractions. What do I need to do in order to add fractions together? Before I can add them together, I need to do what thing? Find a common denominator. Here we have sine, here we have cosine, sine, cosine. What is my common denominator going to be? Yeah, it's going to be the product of each, I shouldn't use that word, the product of each unique factor. Okay, so I'm going to do sine and I'm going to do cosine. Okay, so I get sine times cosine. But because sine is already a product, is already in this product, I'm not going to again multiply by another sine. Okay, I'm not going to do that. It's the same reason why if I did one-third plus one-fifth plus one-third, what would I do? I would take, or plus two-thirds or something like that, what would I do? I would just make the common denominator 15, okay? Because even though there's a 3 here and a 3 here, I'm not going to do, th I'm not going to make the common denominator 3 times 5 times 3 because I already have a 3 in the denominator. It's already a common factor. I don't need to add another one. Does that make sense? You okay with that? Okay, so same principle here, but it's a little bit different. So we have cosine of x, and I'm going to multiply the top and bottom by so, uh, cosine. So cosine of x divided by sine of x times cosine of x plus sine of x times sine of x divided by sine of x times cosine of x plus 1 over sine of x times cosine of x. Okay, I didn't need to multiply the top and bottom of this one by anything because the bottom is already this denominator, isn't it? Okay, so now what do I get? I get something like sine squared of x plus cosine squared of x plus 1 divided by sine of x times cosine of x. Okay, now we have it as a single fraction, but I can still simplify this even more. Does anyone see how I can simplify this a little bit further? Yes, there's an identity which says that sine squared of x plus cosine squared of x is equal to 1. That is the first Pythagorean identity, okay? That's the number one that you need to memorize. Sine squared x plus cosine squared x is equal to 1. So I'm going to rewrite it that way. So I'm going to rewrite. This is 1 plus 1 over sine of x times cosine of x. In other words, it's 2 over sine of x times cosine of x. OK? So the way that I simplify this expression okay, is first to translate. OK, is first to translate everything into sine and cosine. Once I have everything in terms of sine and cosine, all I'm doing from this step to this step to this step to this step to this step 
is the same things that I would do with rational expressions, the same thing that I would do if I was just adding regular fractions to each other. Okay, it's just finding a common denominator and simplifying. Uh, the only real tricky part that I think uh, is a little bit different than that is we replaced sine squared x plus cosine squared x by one because of the Pythagorean identity, which says that those two things are equal to one another. I'd much rather write one than to write all of this crap. So I'm going to do away with all of the extra writing that I have to do because my hand is tired. Any questions on this process, any of the steps? So first, translating, then common denominator, then simplifying a little bit further. Any questions on any of those steps? Was any part of that derivation confusing? Let me ask a more qualitative question. What is the hardest part of this process, do you think? In your opinion? It's an opinion question. No wrong answers. Are you just feeling shy today? It's OK. I'm your friend. <laughs> or is this just so mind-numbingly easy for all of you that you should move on to calculus? <laughs> what's, what's tricky about this? Yeah, so uh, we have to do a lot of replacing, right? Replacing trigonometric expressions with something else that they're equal to. You know, I did it pretty quick, right? From, from this step to this step, I used like five trigonometric identities, <laughs> right? So what I'm hearing from Gavin is that that step's kind of difficult because in order to do it, you have to have several identities memorized. OK, I, what I like to ask these types of questions because if you can think about what is difficult about a problem, then you know what you n need to overcome in order to solve it. And if you know what you need to overcome, then you know what you need to know, and that will help you to study what you should be studying you know, for, for an assessment later on, right? So it's good, at, it's good to ask these sorts of questions when you're doing the homework, is ask yourself, like, what is making this so hard? And that will often lead you to the correct methodology that you need to be using in order to overcome that difficulty, right? But OK, I will get off my soapbox and teach you more math. All right, so let's. Move on to disproving trigonometric identities. I put identities in quotation marks because we, we have an equi well, <laughs> we have an equation here, which is they say it might be an identity or it might not be an identity, and we are supposed to prove that it's not true. I'll show you two ways that you can do it. Way number one: find an x value. which uh, for which identity is false. Okay, And identity means no matter what x value you plug in, this equation will be true. So in order to disprove that, I just need to find one x value, which will cause it to be false. OK, here's the easiest one we could pick. Actually, why don't I ask you all? I'm telling you now that this identity is not true. So we want to find an x value such that if I plug it in here, 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 and simplify, I will get something which is not true. What x values might I try? 
Well, one, I prefer not to use one. The reason being is it's difficult for me to wrap my head around what is sine of one because one radian or one degree, it's not easy for me to make a triangle and see what this number should be. What sorts of inputs are easy to do for angles which we plug into sine and cosine? Yeah, maybe zero would be a natural choice, or pi over two, or pi, or something like that. Like nice round, well not round, but nice round multiples, or uh, or fractions of pi. So let's try try x equals zero and see if it's true. Well, if I plug x equals zero, then I get sine of zero minus cosine of zero uh, squared equals sine squared of zero minus cosine squared of zero, right? And let's see what that's equal to. What is sine of zero? Let's do it together. We put a unit circle. Which direction does zero point? To the right. So we get this point here. What are the coordinates of this point? Yeah, they're one, zero. What is the y coordinate of this point? It is zero. So what is sine of zero? It's zero. How about cosine of zero? Same deal, it points straight to the right. But cosine gives us what? The x value. So that is one. So zero minus one, all squared, is equal to, well, zero squared is zero. And then I get minus, And then cosine squared of zero is one, right? Cosine of zero is one, so one times one is one. So I get zero minus one. So what do I get in the end? I get negative one times negative one, that's one, is equal to zero minus one, that's negative one. Not true. Right? We, we said, look, if this is true, then it must be true when we plug in zero. And if I plug in zero, then we can simplify and get this equation. And this equation is equivalent to the above two. And finally, this final equation is equivalent to all of the above equations, because all we have done is simplify it, right? So we took an equation which looks like we don't know whether it's true or not. We plugged in a number just to see if it works for that number. And it turns out that we got something which is not true. So this statement is to say, no matter what x value you plug in, it's always going to be true. We found an x value such that if I plug it in, I get something which is not true. Therefore, I conclude the original identity. I shouldn't even use the word identity. I'm going to put it in quotations because it's not an identity, is false. OK, it's false. Any questions on that process? So I could have chosen any number of other x values. It's possible that you could choose an x value for which this actually would be true. Namely, if I pick pi over 4. If I pick pi over 4, then this will be like square root 2 over 2 minus square root 2 over 2 which is 0, squared is 0. And we would get on the right-hand side, we would get 2 over 4 minus 2 over 4 would be 0 on this side as well. So we would get 0 equals 0. So it's true if the input is pi over 4. But the statement of the identity is to say it's true for every x value. Okay, If we test 1 and it's true, doesn't necessarily mean it's true for all of the other x values. So my goal is to try to find one such that it's not true. OK? Any questions on that process? OK, so let me put it another way. If I was going to make a claim about the class, 
and say, every student in this class is an engineering major. Could be true, could be false. How do I prove that it's not false? I'm going to ask Lane. Lane, what's your major? Computer science. Oh, crap. His major is <laughs> not engineering, <laughs> right? So what have I just done? I've just disproven my claim. But what if I picked, I don't know, who's an, who's an engineering student? OK, what if I picked Randell? And I said, Randell, what's your major? Engineering. Ah, see, it's true, right? Everyone in this class is an engineer. No, not true. I just need to find one person who's, en who's, uh, whose major is not engineering in order to disprove the claim that everyone in this class is an engineering major. Does that analogy help? What's up? How many people would keep asking before you gave up, though? That's kind of what I'm wondering. Either. Well, that's the thing. Can you, te can, you test e can you test every angle that there is? No. There's an infinitely large set of them. So we need to be a little bit more clever if we want to prove a trigonometric identity. We can't just say, well, it's true for 0 degrees, it's true for 1 degrees, all the way up to infinity degrees. We can't do that. So we have to be clever, more clever than that when we're going to prove trig identities. But disproving them is easy. You just have to find one for which it's not true. OK, so that's way number one. Any questions on way number one? OK, way number two is going to be similar. It's going to be to basically to derive a contradiction, OK? To derive a contradiction. So now I'm going to do it in a different way, which is to say, look, let's look at this equation. We can simplify on both sides. What do I get when I take something minus something else and square it? I'm going to get like a squared plus b squared minus 2ab, right? So let's do that. I get sine squared of x minus, no, plus <coughs> cosine squared of x minus 2 sine of x cosine of x. Oh, maybe this won't lead anywhere. We'll see. On the right-hand side, what do I get? Sine squared of x minus cosine squared of x. OK, so let's see here. How can we simplify this? We can cancel a sine on both sides. We can take 2 cosine squared of x on this side. OK, I'm going to move this one over to the other side. And I get 2 cosine squared of x is equal to, and I'm going to move this one over to the other side to make it positive, is equal to 2 sine of x times cosine of x. And you will agree with me that I can cancel one power of cosine on both sides and get 2 cosine of x is equal to sine of x, 2 sine of x. And I can cancel 2 on both sides. And I get cosine of x is equal to sine of x, which is obviously not true. Here it's easier to see maybe what x values could make this false, like just take 0 or pop pi over 2 or whatever, right? So what did we do? We derived it to cosine x is equal to sine x, which again is going to be true if x is pi over 4, but not true otherwise, right, for general x values. So this one is just really easy to see. I think if you derived it to here, everyone knows. Well, not everyone knows, but I would believe you if you were to say, look, this is clearly not true. And if you want to be really specific about it, you could say, OK, try x equals 0. OK, you could try x equals 0. So obviously is a very dangerous word in mathematics. But in this case, I think it applies, because these two functions are not the same. We've spent like a month learning that. Yes? So would, would, is there like a way in specific that like you would have to use a certain way, or could you use way 1 completely? Or? Yeah, you can just always use way 1 if you want. Um, but sometimes it'll be difficult to see what, are, what is the x value that I need to plug in. And also, it could be annoying if 
that if it's a really complicated expression because you have to evaluate lots and lots and lots of trigonometric expressions for way number one. In this case, it's only four, so it's like not that bad. And two of them are the same as the others, right? So it's pretty easy. But some other ones might be more complicated, so you might want to try to do some simplification like this first to make your life a little easier. But yeah, you can use whichever method you want as long as your reasoning is valid, as evaluated by myself. <laughs> OK. Any questions on way number two? OK, it doesn't seem like there are. So let's move on to the last thing we will talk about today, which will be verifying trig identities. So we're going we're gonna to start. Let's not put too much on the screen at one time. So there are a few methods which we could use to try to verify a trigonometric identity. So the first thing is going to be something like, which will look kind of like way number two here. But imagine if we did all of this work, simplifying, 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 and then at the end, we got something like sine of x is equal to sine of x. If we were able to derive something like that, then we would say, aha, the, this is an equivalent expression which is clearly true no matter what x is. Therefore, the above is clearly true, and the above is clearly true, and the above is clearly true. OK, so that is uh, another way which we could uh, try to simplify both sides or simplify one side so that both sides look exactly the same. If both sides are exactly the same, then we say, aha, these two things are actually equal to one another. So that's way number one. Typically, we will start on the more complicated side. OK, so there will be something complicated on one side, like a fraction of like all sorts of crap, and then like plus another fraction or whatever. And then one side will have like sine of x. OK, in this case, we will start on this side and try to simplify, 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 simplify until we get something like sine x equals sine x. OK, that's one way to do it. OK, way number two <clears throat> is to reduce. And as we reduce, 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 finally we achieve something like sine squared of x plus cosine squared of x is equal to 1. And we say, aha, I know that this is true because this is a known trigonometric identity already. So you take uh, an unknown trigonometric identity and you reduce it into a known identity like a Pythagorean identity or a reciprocal identity or something like that. OK, so that's way number two. And the third and final way is the most treacherous. Okay, it is to transform both sides simultaneously. Not recommended for beginners. But after a while, you'll probably be able to do it. Okay, it will just take some practice and uh, the reason that it's treacherous to try to change both sides simultaneously is that you could kind of move both sides past one another at the same time, right? So if you leave one side the same and try to try to manipulate the other side into looking like that side, then the other side, the right-hand side stays constant, okay? But it's possible that if you change both sides at the same time, they both become something that would have been equivalent to the other. Now, this is too much words to describe a mathematical process. Let me just show you. It's just a little bit delicate, OK? I just want to say that. OK, so let's try this one. We want to show that this is true. It's not immediately clear that this should be true. OK, it's not immediately clear that this should be true. So what am I going to do? I am going to transform one side into the other first. Let's start with method number one. We'll try method number one first. Well, cosecant squared minus 1. Let's go back up to our identities and keep that in mind. Cosecant squared minus 1 is what I'm looking at. 
That looks an awful lot like this trigonometric identity if I were to move the 1 over to the other side, doesn't it? So what is cos cosecant squared minus 1 equal to? Cotangent squared. Yes? So I am going to rewrite this in the following way. I know that this is equal to cotangent squared. Therefore, I can rewrite the whole identity as cotangent squared of x divided by cotangent of x is equal to cotangent of x. And then I will simplify on this side to get cotangent of x is equal to cotangent of x, which is true for all values of x. Okay, we have the same thing on both sides here. So I have verified that this statement here is equivalent to this statement here, is equivalent to this statement here, which is clearly true. Therefore, all of the above are also true. Okay, all of the above are also true. Any questions on this example? Okay, so I used method number one, right, which was to just try to manipulate one side into looking like the other. It was fairly easy to do that way, right? Let me show you another way using method two. So this is method one. Method two would be to do the following. I could multiply both sides by cotangent of x, and then what would I get? I would get cosecant squared of x minus 1 is equal to cotangent of x squared. And then I move the 1 over to the other side, and I would get cotangent of x co squared, geez, cotangent squared of x plus 1 is equal to cosecant squared of x. And then I would say, aha. This is a Pythagorean identity. Which is known to be true. OK, so it's a different, uh, different methodology here. The first method is I'm just going to work on this side until it looks like the right side. The second methodology is, look, we're going to treat this whole thing simultaneously together as an equation. I'm going to multiply both sides by cotangent. I'm going to move some things around until I reduce. I say this equation means the same thing as this equation, which means the same thing as this equation. And this equation is true. I know it to be true because that's one of those Pythagorean identities that I memorized. If you want to really see why this is true, you could even take it a step further. If you don't remember this identity, what could you do? You could multiply both sides by sine squared. If I were to multiply both sides by sine squared, what would I get? I would get cosine squared of x plus sine squared of x is equal to 1 if you multiply both sides of this equation by sine squared of x. That's not going to change the equation. And I get a Pythagorean identity. OK. So that's another way you could try to do that. If you didn't immediately recognize that this is one of the Pythagorean identities. Hopefully, you all immediately recognize that this one is true by now. OK, so two different methods which we can use to try to verify this trigonometric identity. Are there any questions about methodology number one? OK, how about methodology number two? Any questions about that one? OK, then I'm going to ask you to vote on which one you like better. Who likes method number one the best? Almost everyone. How about number two? No, but oh, OK, Sully. Sully likes number two. <laughs> OK, so method number one is probably the easiest. OK, so if, if that's what you like the best, try it first. If it doesn't work, you can always go back and start from scratch with method number two. OK, you, there's nothing wrong with just starting with one. And then tr if it doesn't work out, try another method.
Okay. All right. Uh, I think we'll stop there for today. So exam review tomorrow in class, exam review tomorrow during office hours. Exam two is on Wednesday. It'll be proctored by someone else, but they'll be able to answer any questions that you might have. Yeah. When are you going to the last Tomorrow.